So the one last big thing we wanted to include here was a navigation option up here. Now, I'm just gonna be totally upfront about this. You do not always need to have navigation. Typically, when you only have a few tables like this, a nav is not necessary. Uh, navs are helpful when you have dozens of worksheets and it can be hard to figure out where to go. It can then be nice to add in a few links to make it easy to get different places. Uh, in this case, though, I just wanted to illustrate the idea to folks in case you are in that situation, show you how the whole concept of linked text and icons works within Excel. It's not as hard as you might think, it's just a little trick workaround. So let me show you how we do this. So first things first, I wanna drop in a few icons under the insert tab. You'll see an icons option up here. If you're not on Microsoft 365, you might not have this option, in which case you can go, you know, Google any kind of work use uh, icons because there's tons of them out there. Um, so I'm just gonna say, hey, I want like a, maybe I want like a chart icon. Um, I want like a data, database icon maybe. And then maybe I want like a table icon. So we've got our three icons here. I'm just gonna hold shift, select them, drag them up. I'm just loosely getting them into place here. And I'm gonna kind of shrink these down, make them a little smaller so they fit, something like that. Now I'm gonna hold shift, click each of these. And then over in the format graphic uh, pane over here, I'm gonna give these a solid fill. I'm just gonna make it like a dark green. And I'm gonna make sure these are all kind of aligned loosely around the center. If you hold shift and click all of them under the graphics format tab, you can hit align and hit uh, line center. Now I wanna indicate which one's selected. So to do that, I'm gonna just grab my shape here, shrink it down like so, get the roundness using this upper corner section here. And you know, so I think this, we're gonna need to make it so that this gradient goes to a clear color. So I'm gonna just select one end of the gradient. Uh, I'm gonna make that fully transparent. I'm gonna make sure that the angle's right too. Looks like the angle's a little off. I think we want this at like 180. And I'm gonna have to remove the glow on this. I think I have a glow on it that needs to be taken off. Okay, great. And move that over, click all of our shapes. I'm just gonna bring to front again and then bring that behind. Okay, so and then for the selected one, we'll change the icon color. I'll make this one white so that it stands out. Okay, this looks good. Uh, and of course we need labels for everything. So I'm just dropping some text in here, dashboard. I'll probably change this font size and everything here in a sec. I just wanna place first, raw data. Pivot tables, something like that. Actually, we'll do and change this dashboard font to white because again, it's on that different colored background. And then I'm just gonna select all these, holding shift, multi-select. I'm gonna bring these up to like a 20, I think. So I'm noticing, I think I want these icons a little smaller. Doesn't have to be much smaller, just a little bit. Make sure they're kind of roughly aligned with our text behind them. And then get our text so that it's kind of centered loosely at the same area as the icon. So we don't want it to kind of be low or aligned on the bottom. We want it kind of roughly centered there. I'm gonna right click all these and go to shape format align left so that they all align uh, on the left edge. So I think that looks pretty good. So now to link this text to different sheets, we can just right click the text Go to hyperlink, you can do command K to do this as well. And then under the options, there's gonna be a this document option and you just select the table you want it to link to. Uh, in this case, so raw data is gonna link to raw data, etc. So now here's the trick to make it look like this is a selector. Uh, if we say we wanna jump over to raw data, if we click raw data, on the raw data page, we can just copy paste that whole menu that we had. We're gonna take that background shape and move it from dashboard down to raw data, update the colors. So now raw data is in in that white color. And as you jump between these now, it's gonna feel like a selector. If you were uh, having trouble selecting these because the links, like every time you click them, it's jumping over, under the home tab, there is a find and select option here. You can hit select objects here and then click, excuse me, uh, click and drag starting somewhere off of the objects. And it's gonna select all those and then just hold shift and click that as well. Now we're gonna copy this little window we made here and paste it over. Uh, oh, and just for context, this background shape, this is just a big rectangle. I've added a shadow under the shadow option here. It's a black shadow, 60% transparency uh, with an 18 point blur uh, and a three point distance, just for context, in case anybody wants to replicate that. We're gonna go over to pivot tables here. I'm just gonna make a little space here using by expanding the A column. I'm also gonna make sure we're at the same zoom level as the other pages. Uh, widen this up. I'm just gonna hit paste up here in this upper left hand area. Oh, and I'm sorry, after you use that selection pane, if you're having trouble clicking again, the selection pane can be a little confusing. So you can go to find and select and just click it again to turn it off if you're having trouble clicking. Let me drop that in and let me just get 
this a little wider. Okay, we're just gonna paste that in. And again, we're just gonna get our shape, move it down, and then get our colors updated. And you'll see even I sometimes have problems where I accidentally click it and it links over. So it, I, getting comfortable using that select object option is gonna make life a lot easier for you. All right, we got it. So let's try this, go, go to dashboard. Great, go to raw data. Awesome, go to pivot table. Uh, this is obviously always gonna work best when you have the same zoom level on each page. So these are all at 125% zoom here. Um, just keep it consistent. It doesn't matter what zoom you use as long as it's the same between pages. So there you go. We got ourselves a pretty sweet dashboard with dynamic filtering, a little bit of navigation, some great visuals. And I just wanna show you a couple little nuances if you are on PC. There's one step you're going to have to take. You may have already noticed this as you were doing it. So if you're on PC, you may have noticed some of your pivot charts having little uh, menu options like this. Now, these can be really useful if you want to play around with your data in real time in the dashboard, but sometimes just visually you don't want to have them. So you go to the Pivot Chart and Analyze tab, go to Field Buttons, and just hide all. And that's going to turn all those off and really clean up your chart and make it look a lot better if you don't want those included. And just for context, this is the, that same dashboard opened up on a PC version transferred between PC and Mac. So you're really seeing essentially the same thing and working in very, very similar systems. Almost all these features are super interoperable and going to work fine no matter what machine you're on. So really, our last step here is just doing some cleanup. How do we make this as readable and easy to interpret as we possibly can? Where do we need to make some improvements to the layout, that sort of thing? So in my opinion, our nav looks good. Our slicers and timelines look pretty good. I think our double donut here is about as good as it's gonna get. I could see some potential confusion around people saying, wait, so sales is this breakdown, profits this one. There is the option to add labeling here, but this and this is not a popular opinion. I'm about to share with you here, but I think sometimes these charts are really going to serve a purpose of a visual design element powered by real data. And if folks really want it deeper and they see this and they say, hey, I want to understand the relationship between consumer, corporate, and home office and sales and profit separately, then that's something you can dig into into more detail. This report's not necessarily trying to focus on that area, so I, I'm not too worried about that in this case. Not to say that that's always going to be the case, but just sometimes I think it's acceptable to have something be visual design focused with some level of insight in there, but that not necessarily being the focus of the whole page. I hate to say it, but aesthetics matter and and uh, a lot of people will tell you they don't, but they really do uh, when it comes to presenting these in any kind of organization. Okay, next, uh, we've got our sales history. The only real issue I'm having on this one is that our data labels overlap in a lot of places and can be hard to read. I honestly think we might not need these data labels even. Uh, we have our... Uh, our axes here with pretty clear lines on it. And I'm not sure that somebody's gonna be going through reading each of these. If they really wanted that level of detail, I think they could probably get it from, I think they could probably get it from a, uh, from just looking at the source pivot table. So I'm gonna, I think actually remove these labels. And I think that just looks better and we still get the insight we wanna get. So our geo chart here, now our geo chart's not really giving us a clear insight. It's more just saying, what region are we look at, looking at? Where is the data present? It's reminding us we're in the US and it's reminding us that we're looking at this kind of central region here. Um, geo charts are not super useful for giving insights. It's hard for us to interpret how much bigger, say this value is than this value just by using a gradient of colors. So. I think of them more as UI elements, and I think that's a useful way to think about them. They let you know where you are, and that's a great, useful thing to tell people. Uh, on top of that, I'm just gonna go again into aesthetics here, but I've built hundreds of dashboards over the years, and I've done some A-B testing. And in that, I've tested versions with a geo chart and versions without a geo chart. For whatever reason, versions with geo charts get used more. Uh, I don't know why this is. I can't really say other than the fact that people seem to like geo charts. It's not necessarily that people use the geo charts more, but when you put a geo chart in, that tends to correlate very, very strongly with people using the dashboard more with all the tests that I've done. So I'm just gonna say, you can leave them. I, 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 I'm gonna say you can include them if you want, you don't have to, but they can be a fun visual element and still be quite useful in terms of saying, here's where we're looking at right now. Uh, you'll see this error up here. It says we plotted 27% of locations from your labels data with high confidence. Um, as far as I know, there isn't a way to just turn that off. And it's not that we couldn't actually plot all of our data or we couldn't locate all of them. It's just that if you have blanks, 
in the uh, reference table you're looking at, it's gonna it's gonna say that they couldn't. Uh, I find this a little frustrating, um, but alas, there's not much we can do about it. All right. Let's take a look at profit history here. Uh, one thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna click these bars, get our formatting pane open, and again, I'm gonna have to. I'm just making sure all the bars are selected, not one individual bar. And then under our series option, I'm gonna reduce the gap width a little more here. Go down to like like a 10, eh, maybe up a little higher. I just want to get as much bar in there as possible so it's easier to read. Um, I don't love our date labels here, but there's not really much we can do to improve these, unfortunately. So I think we're going to leave the date labels in in this case because it makes it much easier to interpret, but this isn't an ideal. Um, just cut out that last part about it not being ideal. Again, we could label each bar. Uh, I think it could get a little crowded in this case. We can test it by just going to the design tab, hitting add chart element, and then hitting data label. I'm going to do outside end in this case. So it just, it gets a little crowded. We could shorten those values and do all sorts of other things. But for the most part, I think we, the point is still gets across without having these labels in there. And somebody can even just hover above these and it will tell them the value. Uh, if you hover here, you can see it tells you the value. So that's going to be enough in this case. Now, I think the most problematic part of this dashboard is these charts here. And the reason is that we don't have room to get data labels in here. Uh, we only have room just to get the chart itself in. So effectively, this is just serving as a trend line almost. I think that's still useful in a sense. I think it gives a sense of variance. How much is this changing? It gives a sense of, are we much higher or lower than usual right now? But it would be nice in this case to have some kind of date labels. Um, there's different ways we could do this. We could just manually add in the end date and the start date, just so people have a sense of the time scale they're looking at. We could add some contextual information here, like explain it, this is monthly. It really just depends on your situation. I'm gonna leave these for now, but ideally we would have these with some kind of time series context added to them. Uh, and then just the other one here is I'm noticing that we've got some overlap on our axis, so I'm just gonna reduce the font size on those, so it's a little easier to read them. But yeah, overall, I think we've got a little, we've got a pretty great dashboard here. I typically don't advise poking holes in your own work the way I am when you're sharing something with people, but in this case, I think it's really important to be upfront about out what some of the limitations are here, right? This is not the perfect dashboard. Um, and in fact, I don't even think the perfect dashboard typically exists. It depends on what you're trying to achieve, what your audience is trying to get out of it, how you're just trying to present the data to whoever you're trying to present it to and what you're trying to communicate to them. And I think this can communicate a lot. I think it can give useful insights, especially when we start playing with some of these filters and looking at the data from different perspectives. I think there's a lot to be said here. So this is Josh from the future coming back in because I forgot to add in one very important element to all of this, which is linking these values to actual values from our tables. So I'm just gonna add this in really quick. Throughout the video, you may notice that these numbers aren't updating with the filters it's just because I forgot to get the link up there, but I'm gonna show you how to do it right now. So essentially we've got this value. We want this value to be tied to a real dynamic value from our table. So we're gonna do a couple things. First, we need to create that value somewhere. So over in our pivot tables, we gotta make sure we have the total number because we're showing total sales and total profit there. So we're gonna go to the design tab. Once we're clicked into our pivot table, we're just gonna add grand totals in here. We removed them earlier, we're just adding them back. So in our little cell here above our table, I'm adding a lookup formula. This is going to run through our column find the last value and bring that column up and bring that up to the top. We do this because pointing a text box to an actual pivot table will often not work uh, because our data might change, the reference changes, and you can only use an equals cell value formula in a text box. You can't use equals pivot, which is what you might typically use for reference pivot table. So we have to have our value in a separate cell outside of our pivot table. So here's what we've done here. We've got a lookup. Your lookup value is first going to be two. Your vector is going to be one. And then you're going to put in this little formula here. This is just your cell range for your whole column. And then you're going to have a greater than less than symbol and essentially just two uh, quotation marks all in a parentheses and then comma. And then your result vector is going to just also be that column. You can obviously screenshot this and use it yourself, but just make sure that you change your column reference. And that's just gonna grab the bottom value consistently from whatever size our pivot table is. So now we have a value here and a value here that represent our total sales and our total profit. I've also shortened these so that we know we can fit them into the space that we have. And when I say shortened, what I mean is I'm using K, M, or B at the end to represent thousands, millions, and billions. This is a custom number format that I've added in here. 
We'll go to more number formats here so you can see it. This is the number format I'm using here. It's just a nice way to make sure you know how big your number is going to be. If you have something that varies a lot, it's hard to save enough space for a number that might be two digits long, like 10, and then other times might be six digits long, like 100,000. That means you'd have to leave a lot of empty blank space. But when we summarize it down to K, M, or B, we always know it's going to be no more than one, two, four, five, six digits long, five, five digits long at max. We give it, we give ourselves a little bit of a constraint there. It makes it easier for format. Once we have our number here, we can go back over to our dashboard, click into our text box, type equals, and then go back to the number and click the cell with the number, in this case F1, hit enter, and now these are linked. We're going to just have to reformat this text. It's a little frustrating, but um, when you first link it, you have to reformat the text again. Great. And then now, keep an eye on this number here. As we change it, it's going to update dynamically to reflect whatever's there. Uh, we're going to do the same thing to profit. Hit equals, go over to our pivot table area, hit the number G1 outside of the pivot table, hit enter, and now that's going to be linked up and then we just have to reformat it again. We're going to do the same thing for technology product sales, office supplies, product sales, and furniture product sales. Now, all right, this is Josh from the future again. I just want to show you a version of this where our text is linked up properly. I know in that example, the text wasn't updating properly. Um, so just coming back, showing you that all the text is going to update in real time once you've updated those text boxes to link to that value you've pulled out of your pivot table. Alrighty, that's it, everybody. Thank you for tuning into this whole series. It's been great having you along for the ride. If questions, comments, etc., feel free to leave them or reach out to me and let me know what you think. There's a lot in this series. There's a lot to learn, but I think it's a good starting off point and a great real world example of just all the nuances that go into building something like what you see here behind me. Of course, don't forget to get the sample file if you haven't already. Uh, we've got links in some of the earlier videos, and if you don't see them there, they, I'll make sure they're included somewhere in this video series description. Uh, we're Worst case scenario, you can hop on the newsletter and you'll get uh, copies of files that way as well. This is really a test run for a much longer, more in-depth course I'm going to do that doesn't just focus on one example, but focuses on a much broader range of skills that go into doing this at work, doing it for a living, and doesn't just limit us to the mechanics of building a dashboard, but goes a lot deeper into why we build these, how we build them, what it takes to actually get them built, and buy-in from different stakeholders to make this kind of happen. It's going to be a whole thing, so keep an eye out for that. And again, you can hop on the newsletter if you want to get notified when that's ready. Thank you again. Have a lovely, lovely day, and uh, I hope to see you here on the channel more. Bye-bye.